You have started a revolution with your work, your books, and your talks about、um, the theology of the body by Pope John Paul II. But how did this all start? How did you get involved in all this? I discovered John Paul II's theology of the body in 1993. I was 23 years old, and I remember reading it for the first time and feeling like I had been welcomed into a banquet that really corresponded to my hunger. And we have this hunger as human beings, this yearning for love and for union. And when we're not brought to this banquet, we take that hunger to things that don't satisfy. And I had done that for many years. I had eaten from the wrong menu, so to speak, and I felt ill because it was bad food that I was trying to fill my hunger with. And so, when I discovered this teaching, I, I knew this was the answer to the cry of the human heart. And I, I knew then it was just an intuition that I would spend the rest of my life studying this teaching and sharing it with the world. And the doors have opened up to allow me to do that. I'm a very blessed man. I have the best job in the world. <laughs> I just get to bring hungry people to the banquet. It's great. And what has fascinated you the most about theology of the body? Is there anything? Oh wow! Fascinated me the most. God's plan for our lives is far more beautiful and stupendous than we can dream or imagine. And the idea that our our very bodies tell a story, our bodies as male and female tell a story of divine love. I like to say God speaks to us in sign language, and the the greatest sign He's given us is our creation in the image and likeness of God as male and female. And of course, that culminates in the incarnation. This idea that God Himself took on a body, the very body of God, is the sign of God's eternal love. God giving up His body for us, and the idea that the union of man and woman. Is is a great sign of Christ's union with the Church. This just blows my mind and 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 sets my heart on fire when I realize that stamped right in our bodies as male and female, the very reason we're attracted to the human body is because we're looking for God. We're looking for Jesus. We're looking for union with God forever. All the the sexual craziness in the culture today. What it really is, it's the human desire for heaven gone berserk. And the gift of the theology of the body is that it unberserks it, and redirects our hearts to what we really long for. That continues to fascinate me. So, how has this influenced your life besides having the best job in the world?、Uh, I, I I couldn't understand myself as myself without what John Paul II has ta- has taught me. I really consider him my holy father, and it's really the the role of the father, isn't it, to tell his children. About the meaning of life, the meaning of sexuality, the meaning of love, and I've learned this from John Paul II. I, I, I couldn't understand myself. I couldn't understand my place in the universe if I if I hadn't encountered this theology of the body. I don't think I would. And I guess it's also changed like your behavior towards women towards other people. It changed everything. I mean, knowing the theology is one thing; living it is another. And it's a long journey to really integrate your heart with the message because we're all so broken, and I'm just as broken as anyone.、Uh, but we need to have the bar held up to what we're really called to be, and even if we are far from that bar, we trust in God's mercy, and that mercy, as we open our hearts to it, it continues to transform us, and it continues to help us make that journey. So. It, it has it has informed and transformed my life, and continues to do so. It's never you never arrive. There's always more that you can learn from this vision that John Paul gave us, because we're talking about eternal mysteries, and there's always more brokenness that we discover in our humanity that needs to be transformed. But I see this teaching as really giving me hope that that transformation is possible, and I love to give that hope to other people. Change is possible. Transformation is possible. Forgiveness is possible. Healing is possible, and the fulfillment of the deepest yearnings of our heart. This is possible, and this is the hope that this teaching gives us.、Um, in the eyes of a lot of people, the church still has a bad reputation. Speaking of sex, but how come there are so many people interested are coming here tonight and interested in hearing what you and what the church has to say about sexuality? 
Well, the, the imagery I was using earlier is about this hunger we have. And most of us, we're raised with what I call the starvation diet gospel. When it comes to this most fundamental hunger, we're told next to nothing. We hear a list of rules to follow, but those rules don't seem to correspond with what we're really looking for. So then we take the hunger elsewhere. We take the hunger to what the culture tells will feed us. And then we get ill because the food that the culture gives us makes us ill. And then we, we get to a point in our lives where we're looking for something more. We're looking for something else. And this is where hearts are really open to what the church truly teaches. We've heard the caricature of what the church teaches. We've heard rules, but we haven't heard the beauty of the vision behind what the church teaches. That's what changes lives. That's what transforms hearts. That's what gives us hope. And that's why I think so many people are wanting to learn more about this because we've, we've tried other things and found them wanting. And this gives people hope that the yearning we really feel deep inside was put there by God not to frustrate us, but to lead us to ultimate satisfaction in what Scripture calls the marriage of the Lamb. You see, the union of man and woman, the whole mystery of sexuality is just a sign. It's meant to point us to something far greater. And John Paul II is basically saying to the modern world in the theology of the body, well, you want to talk about sex? Okay, well, let's talk about sex, but let's not stop at the surface. Let's have the courage to enter what Scripture calls the great mystery of our creation as male and female in the call of the two to become one flesh. If we have the courage to enter that great mystery at its depth, we will find ourselves at the heart of the gospel itself and right on the threshold of the fulfillment of our deepest yearnings. That's good news. It is, definitely. Um. Nowadays, especially young people are longing for these long-lasting relationships, for real love in their lives. But how can their desires become reality? How can you help them? Well, all I can be is a witness. And I love the title to John Paul II's biography. It's Witness to Hope. And that's what I want to be, a witness to hope. I can't change anyone's life. That's the job of the Holy Spirit. But I can be a witness to hope. And when you catch this hope, it becomes contagious. Uh, we all have so many hurts in our lives, so many broken relationships, so many scars from, from just the, the difficulty of being human in the world today. But the hope we have is the hope of healing. Jesus calls us on a journey. And he says, take nothing for the journey but a walking stick. And that, to me, is an image that we got to get we got to get used to being on a journey. We have to make peace with the journey, and we don't get ultimate satisfaction and happiness in this life. We're pilgrims. We're journeying to another life, and that's very important to keep in mind. Because if we, if for example, if we expect that human love is going to fulfill the deepest desire of our hearts, we're going to be terribly disillusioned, because human love can't fulfill the deepest desires of our heart. We're all broken. I love my wife deeply. She loves me deeply, but we're broken. So I hurt her and she hurts me. And, and you know, one of the things you learn early on in married life is that the hunger, the deep ache is still there. Marriage doesn't take it away. And that points to the fact that we're created for an infinite marriage, an infinite union of love. That's the hope the gospel gives us, not a fulfillment in this life but of the hope of fulfillment in the next. And then what we do get in this life is foreshadowings of that fulfillment. All the beautiful and wonderful things in human life, including and maybe especially human love, when it's lived rightly, it does give us a beautiful foreshadowing of our destiny. It's an icon, we could say that. Sexual love, the love of man and woman lived rightly, is an icon of divine love. But we must be very careful that we don't turn the icon into an idol. And we turn sexual love into an idol when we expect the sexual relationship to fulfill all my deepest yearnings. It can't do that. But it can point us to a union that does fulfill our deepest yearnings. And that's union with God.
What does it mean to live love rightly in short sentences? To live love rightly, we have to become more and more authentic images of God. Now, this is the new commandment Jesus gives us. Love one another as I have loved you. One of the great insights of John Paul II's Theology of the Body is that this call to love as Jesus loves is literally chiseled in our bodies. A man's body makes no sense by itself. A woman's body makes no sense by itself. But seen in light of each other, we discover this beautiful call to holy communion. Now you're asking, how do we live that communion in a way that is authentic love? Well, we have to look to Jesus. How does Jesus love? Jesus loves freely. He says, I do not, they do not take my life from me, I lay it down freely. He loves totally, without any reservation. He gives himself over completely without holding anything back. He loves faithfully. He says, I'll never leave you, I'll never forsake you. He loves fruitfully. He came so that we might have life and have it to the full. So we see in the way Jesus loves, a love that is free, total, faithful, and fruitful. And you know what another name for that kind of love is? Marriage. That's what a man and a woman commit to at the altar. The priest asks them, have you come here freely to give yourselves without reservation? And they say, we have. Then the priest asks them, do you promise to love faithfully all the days of your life? They say, we do. Then the priest asks them, do you promise to receive children lovingly from God? They say, we do. So the marriage commitment itself is the commitment to love as Jesus loves, because Jesus comes to love us as a husband loves his wife, freely, totally, faithfully, fruitfully. In our world today, we don't understand love as something that we commit to unto death, and yet our heart still yearns for it. Our heart yearns for a love that lasts forever. We will recognize that the church imposes nothing on the human heart when the church invites us to hold out for a committed love, for a beautiful love, for a love that lasts forever. That's what we desire. And we have that capacity with God's help. We are worth that kind of love, and we shouldn't settle for anything less. How would you explain to a teenager, in three sentences, uh, why he or she should wait until marriage? Do you desire to be loved? Do you desire to be used? Or do you desire to be loved? And people will say, well, it's okay to have sex with someone if you really love the person. And I say, I couldn't agree more. But what does it mean, really, to love the person? As we were just saying, to really love the person means I give myself to you freely, totally, faithfully, and fruitfully. If that's the love you have for the person you're with, well, then go see a priest. It's time to get married. Well, people say, well, well, that's not what exactly. I mean, I well, well." well, don't confuse your desire for pleasure with love. Because if we treat other human beings only as a means of our pleasure, we're not loving them. We're using them. And we know it if we're honest with ourselves. We are never meant to be used. We're meant to be loved. If you desire truly to be loved and not used, then wait for someone who is willing to lay down his or her life for you, freely, totally, faithfully, fruitfully. And that commitment is called marriage. Okay, last question. What can we do to spread this message of hope in Paul II? First of all, we have to take it up ourselves because you can't give what you don't have. And if there's anyone listening to this interview, I encourage you, please take up a study of this beautiful teaching of John Paul II. It will rock your world and change your life. You will come to an understanding of your body and your sexuality and the longings of your heart that will change everything. You'll never be able to look at yourself the same way again. You'll never be able to look at another human being the same way again. You'll never be able to look at a tree the same way again or the stars or the sunset because this message is everywhere. All of creation is singing a love song. All of creation is trying to tell us of the love of God. 
and our bodies especially tell us this. When our eyes are open to this, it changes everything. And then we become, for others, a witness to this beauty. And when you witness to this beauty, when you witness to this hope, it is contagious. A, a, a fire spreads. So again, first thing we have to do, take it up ourselves. If we don't know what this is, maybe you've heard about it. Oh, theology, why? maybe I heard about, oh, is that about sex? Is that about that? Go discover what it's about and give some time to it and let it inform you and transform you. And then you will become an agent of information and transformation for others. Thank you very much. Thank you.